All right then, Warwick. Well, I guess this is uh, coronavirus frustration podcast number three, potentially. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, and a return leg um, in terms of uh, we did well, you, we did one where you were interviewing me, and I thought it'd be good if I did one interviewing you. Um, you're uh, what I would say a, a, is a, an up and coming Scotch pilot, and you seem to have progressed quite quickly, which is quite interesting. It's been quite interesting watching your progression, I guess. Um, you, you've had some great trips. You've changed your gliders a couple of times. You're now doing some really good flights and interesting lines. And, and you seem to have sort of totally immersed yourself in the sport and uh, even finding time to chair the uh, SHPF, yeah, so the Scotch Hang Gliding and Paragliding Federation. Excellent. Uh, and we'll maybe come back to touch on some of those things uh, in terms of like the script for the talk, if you like. Um, I guess some of that stuff around progression and glider choice and uh, how, how you've, you know, what you've learned um, in, in, I guess, which is uh, sort of relatively few years, really. Yes. Um, that's right. Well, I mean, it's, it's um, very kind of you to um, talk to me, Tim, and I feel extremely unworthy. Um, I certainly haven't flown 170k across the entire land mass of Scotland. Um, but no, it's, it is. It's been fascinating for me. Um, I, I was a bit of a latecomer to the sport. I mean, I didn't start until I was nearly 40. Um, and I think that's actually be, probably a good thing in some respects in that I suspect that if I'd started in my 20s, I might have killed myself quite quickly. <laughs> um, I was a bit of a nutter when I was back in the army, my army days and then after that. Um, but I've probably mellowed. Um, well, hopefully I've mellowed quite a lot since then. Um, but at the same time, in this, you know, while I've been paragliding, which is six years um, almost to the day, um, I've also got married and had two small kids. So my life has changed quite dramatically, uh, you know, my personal life as, as well as learning to fly. And it's interesting how um, about how that, how my personal life now informs quite a lot of my paragliding thinking. Um, and having two small children certainly, uh, again, has just perhaps taken the, you know, some of the well, it's, it's um, persuaded me to be even more careful and leave myself even more margin than I might have done otherwise. So that's a good thing. Yes, yeah. yes, uh, I'm similar. I uh, I was flying when I had my daughter, uh, what twelve years ago now, and uh, it does change your outlook a little bit. And also, uh, in terms of competing demands on your time, uh, I did wonder how you were juggling things and how your how your wife was with your your flying, uh, your flying uh, passion, I guess. Uh, that's the right word. Well, is she is she is she very good about it, or is she starting to resent? I <laughs> know uh, she's really she's amazing. I mean, um, I'm very grateful to her um, for being as cool about it as she is. I mean, I have to say that we're in a very very fortunate position in that we, my wife and I, run a, a tourism business which we run together and we run from home. So I'm here at home with her and with the kids, you know, 365 days a year, um, other than when I'm flying. And I'm typically flying, you know, 30 to 40 days a year. So I, you, my argument is that she gets to see me and I'm here to support her with the kids a hell of a lot more than, you know... Um, I would be if I was going out to work Monday to Friday, nine to five. Um, and she seems to accept that, <laughs> that point of view and is very cool about me going flying. Actually, I mean, it's my business that um, does prevent me from flying. And the day that you did your epic record-breaking flight um the reason I couldn't come out that day was because I was with clients and you know I was doing my job um and it's it's slightly mildly unfortunate that my sort of work season starts in April and ends in September uh, so obviously coincides with the Scottish flying season but I mean even so I'm still able to get out uh, again a hell of a lot more than I would um if I had a nine-to-five job working in an office and so, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I consider myself so blessed because of that. 
Um, so when yeah. when I do miss out on epic days, and it does happen, um, I just have to be stoical about it and accept that, you know, that's life. Yes, yeah. you need a bit of stoicism, and you obviously uh, you live in quite a nice part of the world in terms of access to to some 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 nice mountains near you, eh? That's right. So I'm in Strathglass, um, just west of Inverness, and um, from my house I can see a Corbett and um, just beyond that I've got Glen Affric, Glen Strathfair and Glen Canick, which is this sort of incredible you know mountainous playground um, it, it has Carnay which is the highest Monroe north of the um, Great Glen um, within it and um, it's inc- it's really beautiful it's major boonies mind you there's not <laughs> there's not many roads in there but um I just love I love it there. I I'd love for more pilots, Scottish pilots, to come and fly um, in this area, but it's quite difficult to get to. I mean, for the Aberdeen boys, it's a you know three hour drive to get here, and the same for you know you guys a bit further south. So um, not an awful lot of pilots come here, and myself and some of the Highland Club boys tend to you know just explore it on our own some of the t- quite a lot of the time. But it's fantastic. I've also I mean I live at the bottom of a of a steep south facing slope um, which is probably about 100 meters high um, which has got a launch at the top of it and I do you know so I can literally walk out my back door and 15 minutes later launch I've never managed to fly an XC from the hill above my house but it is definitely doable so that's one of my sort of um, ambitions. <laughs> it's got to be on the bucket list then, yeah. Yeah, but that, totally. that, that maybe says something about uh, your progression, and we'll, we'll come back to that, uh, and possibly something about some of the lines that you've been flying, which I think are quite interesting. You don't seem to be scared of going in deep, so we'll maybe come back to that as well. But just, just sort of get the ball rolling. Tell us a little bit about where you learned and, uh, you, you know, why, uh, what it was that drew you to sports six years ago. Well, um, I'd, I'd always wanted to fly. I had... Um, um, flying dreams while asleep um, all of my life and I had like recurring dreams about flying and I hear that uh, from a lot of people Um, seems to be quite a common thing that's me as well and I had um, I I, when I was younger it doesn't seem to happen to me anymore but I used to have what I think are referred to as lucid dreams so like dreams where I could almost control um, my flying uh, within the dream and it was all linked to do with um, concentration and various other factors and the more I, the more I concentrated the you know the higher I could fly etc it was, it was really weird but also so cool and I used to wake up you know really happy having had those those dreams um, and then I was um, hitchhiking through the Andes um, shortly after 9-11 and um, and I saw some paragliders flying off a hill and I, I was totally skinned. So I walked up the hill and I sat at the top of the hill, um, really envious of these guys um, flying. Um, there was a tandem set up, basically. And at the end of the day, um, as the sun was setting, there was only one guy left on the hill. And I went, I'd, I hadn't had the bravery to go and talk to them, but I, I sort of gathered my courage and I went and spoke to him. And he spoke a little bit of English and I chatted to him for a few minutes. And then he said, well, look, I've got to fly down and, um, you know, I could do with a passenger. Would you like to come with me? So I said, yes, please. And um, we launched. And I think because it was the end of the day and I was not a paying passenger, he was just having fun for himself. And we boated about for about half an hour. And I was just... I just absolutely thought it was the coolest thing ever. Um, but then, and, I, and so I sort of decided that I would paraglide, but then, I don't know, I just never did it. And I, I think it was because I thought that it was going to be a hell of a lot harder to learn than it actually ended up being. Um, and, you know, life got in the way. I had ve- various jobs and very busy jobs, etc. And it was my 39th birthday, and I thought, shit, I'm getting old. Um, I better start doing some of the things I've always meant to do and paragliding was top of the list and so I sort of literally just googled how do you learn to paraglide and I st- I found the Flying Fever School in Aaron with Zabdi with Zabdi yep and I went to Malaga with 
uh, with her, and that was basically where I did my EP. And um, I, I then spent a summer, so this was in 2014, um, I spent a summer driving down to Aaron whenever I possibly could to, to, to get some more training. But it's a hell of a long way from Inverness to Aaron, and um, it didn't really work out that well. So um, I was EP for a long time. I was like, I can't remember how long, but like a year and a half or something, two years maybe even. And I, I, I was lucky that the Highland Club lads were cool about me probably breaking the uh, BHPA rules and coming out and flying um, ne- close to them, shall we say, while EP. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was, a, that was to be honest with you, I learned as much just from going out with those guys as I did probably from the school. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then um, <clears throat> a big step forward. So I would say that my progression has been in... in in leaps like I've had periods of stagnation and then I've had and I've done things which have resulted in a big step forward and there's been a few of those um I went to um Hotel California in the south of Spain with Dirk I've not been with Dirk yeah and he was absolutely superb um I think he probably realized almost immediately that um I was really pretty pretty wet behind the ears. Um, I was on an A-wing at the time, I was on a Bolero. And he, it was, it was a very small group of pilots staying at the hotel and there was only about four of us and he really looked after me for a week. And that was really my first opportunity to do some sort of prolonged thermaling flights. Um, didn't do any cross country, but you know, places like Ottawa, you can sort of fly, you know, for an hour, two hours, just thermaling, thermaling, thermaling. And so that was, really really good and um at the end of that week he said to me Warwick you need to get rid of that bolero and buy yourself a tequila and good. and that was good what advice I, yeah, yeah good advice yeah it really was good advice I mean um it wasn't until I got the tequila that I realized what a kind of barn door the bolero really was um and um that tequila was an was just such a fantastic progression wing um you know i went from from having never done an xc um on that tequila to flying 120k in india you know a year or so later so um it took me me and that me and that wing um progressed <laughs> a long way together yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that that's probably about the time that I would have met you then, because I think the first time we met was down at Tinto, on the north side, and you were there with your wife. Maybe you weren't married at the time. I'm not sure. You had the terrier. Don't think you had any kids with you. Um, no, that's right. Uh, we weren't married. No, Becky and I weren't married. Um, we'd walked up there, as you say, with the dog. I think the North South Cup were there that day, weren't, weren't they? I'm not sure if it was that day or not, to be honest. But I remember it being Tinto, and I remember you with the dog a little. Uh, Jack Russell Terrier type thing, That's and right. uh, I remember your wife being there, and I thought, oh, obviously the the, the young loves because his wife's still coming out with him, or his girlfriend's still coming out with. Him. I wondered how long that would last. To be uh, honest. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was, well, I tell you what, that day nearly ended our relationship because uh, I mean, not I'm, I'm not being serious, but we there was a sort of minor marital tiff that actually happened in the air. So I had just been, I had just got Fly Sky High on my iPhone and I was sort of experimenting with it. And Becky and I had had a conversation on the way up the hill about whether or not I should put the phone onto airplane mode. And if I didn't, you know, that she might be able to ring me in flight. And, you know, that would be novel. Or if she needed to get hold of me, um, she would ring me in flight. Anyway, so um, I'm sure you remember that day. Suddenly everything kicked off quite rapidly we were all sort of chilling out on the hill and then these really strong thermic cycles started coming through and there was wing, wings thrashing about all over the place and then we all got off at the same time there's quite a few pilots there wasn't wasn't there yeah, yeah um and it was a bit hectic there was sort of a quite a lot of scratching and kind of low thermaling going on with a lot of pilots kind of crossing each other's paths and whatever and i was you know again still very novice and slightly freaking out and I was just starting to get some turns in 
Um, just get, I just got enough height to be able to sort of get 360 turns. And I was looking at the thermal tracker on Fly Sky High, and my wife <laughs> decided to ring me. Um, and so my phone was ringing, and I couldn't, I couldn't answer it because of my gloves on. So I ripped my glove off. I was probably about 70 meters above the hill. I ripped my glove off with, uh, with my teeth, jabbed the answer button on my phone, and screamed, "Get off the fucking phone, <laughs> Becky!" <laughs> and um, she said to me later, "Well, you, need, you needn't have answered the uh, call because I heard you from the ground." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was okay. a good, quite a good day. I managed to get to base. Um, Mark Robson, I don't, Mark Robson had come up to me on launch and said, "Look, Warwick, this is potentially going to be quite a um, booming spring day. You know, you need to be really on it." Um, and he was obviously he was obviously nervous for me, as and Mark was a real mentor to me earlier on, and um, actually really sweetly wrote me a quite a long letter at one stage basically saying look Warwick you've you've got to survive the next year and uh, and these are some tips to how to do that and um, he he was looking out for me that day and then shortly after that incident with my wife um, probably 10 minutes later he and I were thermaling together at base um, which was yeah really really fantastic and I didn't get very far I I did the transition to the south and then bombed out but um, but no it was cool it was a nice day yeah, I was going to say, uh, do you remember, I mean, I remember my first sort of trip to base. Did, it, was that, that wasn't your first trip to base. Do you remember your first sort of time at Cloud Base, as it were? I do, yeah. It was in June 2015, so about a year, I guess I'd been flying for about a year and a bit. And um, myself and Neil Rowlings had driven down to Annick Moor. There was a few yeah. boys there. And um, I'll never forget the cloud. There was this cloud... Um, just over the car park kind of quarry area in front of Alec Moore that looked like a yeah. hot cross bun. Um, since it's Easter, I'll get an Easter reference in. It was just this like beautiful circular bun of a, of a cloud with a flat bottom and a kind of, you know, and a, and a rounded top. And it just looked like, literally like a sort of, someone had, you know, drawn it in a, in a cross country flying book. And I, I launched, I was actually, I think I was one of the first pilots off and I just flew out underneath it, and I started going up, and I started turning, and um, yeah, and then it was just this, this weird realization that I was going to get to base, and you know the sensation of getting colder, and um, excited, but frightened as well, and um, and then getting to base, and then Neil was on the radio because he'd caught me up. Um, saying, right, what are we going to do now? And I I said, well, I, I think I can see a cloud street in front of us, <laughs> which is like, to, I mean, I didn't have a fucking clue what I was talking about. Um, and, I, and I set off into wind um, on, my, on my tequila, on my low B. And, um, and of course, I was on the deck about 10 minutes later. Um, and Neil went off downwind and flew a 30k XC, I think, that day. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I've never, I'll never forget the first time I climbed to base and that elation of getting there, you know. And, it was amazing. As you say, that sort of anticipation, sort of, hey, what do I do now? And there was a little bit of fear mixed in with it. But, yeah, the absolute uh, override enjoy of getting to base for the first time. I, I don't think there's anything quite like it. Eh? I think it's a bit like losing your virginity. It's like, you know... <laughs> It's like, is this is this know. actually no. going about to happen? I'm not. I think this is actually going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's move it on a bit from there then. So you're on the tequila. Well, it's a good choice, good low B. Looks after you, nice and safe. But a little bit of performance. Is that the wing that you took to India? Yes. So, so when when would that trip have been? Because I remember seeing you sort of go, you know, haven't met yet Tim till that time, and then not really, uh, you know, our paths don't cross that that often due to geography, really. But then I, I saw some postings from India, and I thought. Uh, you know, you were doing some good stuff over there. I was quite impressed. Uh, what year would that have been? Um, so that was 2016. It was October 2016. And, um, yeah, so I'd been flying for two and a bit years. And I felt... I think I felt a bit stuck. Um, I'd gone through a couple of years of a hell of a lot of failure. You know, 
lots of turning up to the hill with a bunch of boys and they'd all gone cross country and I'd, and I'd not and being frustrated but I'd also had a few you know I had had some success and I'd, I'd been to um, to Hotel California and that had been a great step forward for me um, and so I booked on to one of Jockey's um, India XC safaris and I think I probably knew when I booked on it that um, I wasn't quite ready for it. But at the same time, I, I always feel like to progress in any sport, if you play against guys who are better than you, you know, that's the way that you're going to really get better faster. Obviously, yeah. there's quite a high stakes um, strategy in paragliding and um, it nearly didn't pay off. But I think one of the, what I um, did, which was good, was that I went and did an SIV in Turkey just before I went out to India. So I did the SIV on the tequila. I came home. I was literally only home for about two weeks, and then I flew out to India. Um, and it ended up being a great trip, but it didn't start very well. We arrived um, in Beer, and then the, fir- the next day was supposed to be the first paragliding day, and it was cancelled because a, a guy had died um, the previous day. And so the local authorities had had um, prevent, you know, had cancelled flying for a day. Yeah. So we were stuck in our hotel, you know, kind of frustrated as hell, but also, you know, with this sort of psychological um, dead weight of of the fact that a guy had died the previous day um, in the back of our minds. And then the following day, we went out up and we launched and um, started going um, west. And I just very, very quickly discovered that I was massively out of my depth. And I was taking collapse after collapse after collapse. And um, we ended up on a on a nose. I think it's just the nose just east of Big Face. And there's a sort of nose there that you have to kind of climb up before you cross the yeah. face. And um, you know, so you're thermaling, but you're pretty close to the ground. You're only, you know... 20, 30, 40 metres off the ground. And I was just getting big frontals, repeatedly getting big frontals, and I was absolutely shitting myself. And I I, um, I went, I said, said on the radio to Debu, um, Debu, I'm really like at the top end of my kind of comfort range here. And he he looked after me. The the guides were Debu and Stefan Bernhardt, and they were both fantastic as well as as well as Jockey, obviously. Um, he looked after me, got me through that day. But the uh, but that evening, I sat on the end of my bed in the hotel, and I thought to myself, my my wife is pregnant. I'm out here doing this for fun, and I'm. And I feel like I nearly died several times today. You know what? I'm, what the hell am I actually doing here? And I, I, I've never had. I don't. I mean, I, I'm normally, you know, I'm quite a sort of physically and mentally robust person, but I really held my head in my hands for about an hour, thinking, "What the hell am I going to do?" And I pretty much made my mind up that I was going to go and tell Jockey that I was sacking it, and I want, and I was going to go home, basically. And then I thought, well, I'm going to give it one more go. And the, you know, as you know, in, in beer, the great thing is that you're, you're flying this ridge um, or, and you've got the massive valley in front. So if, if it all goes tits up, you can just fly out into the valley. So I thought... Just I'll, fly out. Yeah. yeah. So I thought, I'll go and give it another go. And if I'm not happy, I will just fly out into the valley and I'll just land and I'll just enjoy being in India. So I went back up and the next day was, I think the first day had probably been a particularly kind of spicy day. The next day was a lot easier. And I'd also had a good chat with Debu in the hotel about like active flying. And um, he'd given me some pointers. And I found the second day a lot easier. And then it just got better and better and better. And by the end of that, um, I think it was two weeks we were out there, I was flying the tequila like... I, you know, I, I was flying it to its maximum. I was on yeah. full, full bar uh, between climbs. I was, you know, if I was taking collapses, it was just, it was just funny, you know, just laughing and flying on. Um, although the number of collapses had gone down dramatically. And um, I'd flown to Dharamshala and back. It's 120k. Yeah. And yeah. I think we did 50 hours that over the course of the... Um, of the course so 
you know that that was a, a massive massive leap forward for me um that trip and i came home feeling like a different pilot a totally different pilot um so, you know, these, these collapses that you were getting, uh, I know you, you, the flying in, in beer can be, especially in the autumn, can be affected by inversions and, and that type of thing. It can get quite rough at inversions. Was it, and you sort of said it was quite feisty conditions, but was it partly that you just hadn't learned to fly actively or, yeah. or was it like a combination? No, I think, well, I think it was a combination. I think that was, that first day was quite tasty um, and there were some inversions and, and also... Um, there are a couple of spots, particular spots that are worse than other places. Um, yeah. And I, th- you know, when I think one of the things I learned was that if you're not if you're not enjoying it in one spot, then just fly away and try and find somewhere a bit better. But yeah. but mostly yeah. it was just no, I, d- I didn't have a bloody clue about active flying. And um, you know, it, I was thinking with this sport, it's incredible how one sentence someone can say one sentence to you, and it can change things for you so dramatically and I remember Debu saying to me you know if you feel your line goes slack one of the brake lines you've got to whack your hand down and if that means whacking your hand down so it's on your hip to reinflate the wing or, pre- or prevent a collapse then so be it you know as long as you bring it back up again quickly yeah and I didn't know that and no you know no. I I um I applied it the following day and I, I mean, I literally went from having like multiple collapses in each thermal I was in to having practically no collapses. Keeping um, that pressure in the wing and, and yeah. managing it a bit more. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I met Debu uh, in India in 98 when I was there and I was a bit like you. I was sort of uh, a bit younger, a bit more dangerous. And uh, uh, Debu was just a boy in them days. I, I, he couldn't have been more than 16, 17, I guess. Uh, but he was uh, already a good pilot. And uh, yeah, quite quite a, quite a crazy place, India, and a good place to learn. It's sort of where I learned to do uh, Alpine XC, and I did that Dharamsala run. That was my first proper XC. I did it on my own with a couple of vultures. You know, it's quite a magical place. Eh? Uh it's just, I mean, magical's the word. We we did one day when we went over the back, <coughs> um, and um, got up to five thousand meters. And, um, you know, again, you know this, but um, when you start off in India, you're quite in the, in the kind of inversion and it's quite hazy and your, your um, visibility is not that fantastic, sort of up and down the, the valley. But then when you climb up higher, you, it's like you just come out of all the haze and you leave all the pollution below you and suddenly... Um, the air is just crystal clear and you can see the white caps of the Himalaya to the north and all the colours suddenly become more vibrant and um, and also I guess you're getting up to nearly 5,000 metres you're probably uh, your, bra- your brain's being affected a little bit as well and maybe it's a sort of slightly trippy experience as well but I'll never forget spending probably a good 40, 40 minutes or so nearly 5,000 metres with with just with the gang of pilots that I was with and just flying around and around in circles. We weren't going anywhere. Um, but just what incredible views of the of the Himalaya and the valley below. And and then we flew forward out over the kind of main valley at, at incredible height and looking down at all the, um, you know, the, uh, the patterns of the... Um, what they call the paddy Paddies. field yeah the paddy fields yeah, and stuff yeah. just it was just mind-blowing absolutely mind-blowing yeah uh, yeah. yeah well it, it sounds as though you're already sort of uh, learning about the lines and and, and going in deep and uh you, you know i was quite envious because in the old days we didn't go over the back so much and it was quite interesting going back i, I went back this time uh, this this year for or well, this year just gone uh, 20, 2019 uh, for the first time in in 10 or 12 years i think and uh it was interesting that there was much more of this taking off on the east side very early in the day, climbing up before the moist air came in with the clouds and the inversions really set up. So it was very much just getting the, the, the first thermals to the top of the uh, Hanuman Peak, as they call it now, and, and, and getting over the back before the clouds came. And uh, it was interesting to see and it expanded my sort of horizons again you know and I think that's the thing I, I, I find with these trips is, is it gives you a chance to sort of take your glide you know, take take your fly in you know two or three weeks flying 
to the next plateau, as it were, and, and often expand your horizons. And, uh, and, and they are, you, you did a, a few trips there, and, and I guess they've been an important part of your progression, eh? Yeah, absolutely, totally. I mean, and it was after that, so... Um, and the, during the India trip, Jockey said to me that, that like the tequila is a bit of a sort of fifty cc moped, um, you know. And he said, I think you're probably ready for something, the next step up. So um, that's so I got that was that trip was in October. So I packed up the tequila for the winter, and then it, I sold it in the spring. Um, sold it to to Gavin from um, from Aberdeen, yeah. um, and. Um, I bought the chili. So again, yeah, the the, the the India trip sort of elevated me to the point where I was felt ready for a I definitely felt like I was flying the pants off the tequila and there was I there was nothing much more I could do on it. Um and um so I I felt I was ready for a step up. But yeah, the so the chili but the chili was was a big step up though, I have to say. I was quite taken aback at um what a big st- like the chi- the the ch- step up from the Bolero to the chili, sorry, to the tequila, hadn't felt like a huge step up in terms of kind of pilot demands. But I did feel like the step up from the tequila to the chili was quite a big step up, and it took me quite a long time to get get the hang of the chili. Um, although I loved it when I did get the hang of it. Um, yeah, I remember talking to you at the time, and I think you tried the Phantom and a couple others, maybe, didn't you? And you were thinking about the chili, and I, and I sort of said, look, you'll be all right. It's, it is quite an active glider, but it, it, it tends to be uh, giving you a lot of feedback without really uh, giving you a lot of punishment, as it were. But but it is, it's a, it is a pilot's glider, I guess, and you do feel a lot on the chili foray. Eh? Yeah, well, I think that was what I didn't realise was that um, all of that sort of active activity and it talking to me didn't you know that wasn't going to translate into something horrible happening and i didn't i didn't really realize that until i I took it on an siv um which i didn't do until i'd had the glider for about a year so again i I went out with another with jockey again to to all and um i was pretty second your second siv second siv and i was pretty nervous flying off of um bad bad bag um on it and i really thought i was going to get a spanking and um, and then you know flew out and did a asymmetric collapse and it was just a total non-event. I mean, it, yeah. it didn't even change direction. And then no. frontals were just banging out instantaneously. And then we were doing frontals on bar, and it was just you know after two days, I was suddenly realised that the chili's just a pussy cat, really. Yeah. Um, so yeah. so that was a good thing to do, and I kind of wish I'd done the SIV earlier because I think that would have given me the confidence of, of the wing a lot earlier. Um, so what we went we're into sort of 2018 by now are we after that SIV was that 2018? Um, I guess so. Um, I can't actually remember off the top of my head, but yeah, yeah, something yeah. round about then, yeah. So not not so long ago, and no. and, and, and uh, I, I guess it had more ag- more agility and, and back to Scotland, and, and you start to do some nice uh, XCs uh, in and around where you live there, and and, and in Scotland on the chilly. Yeah, I mean, it was really noticeable. I don't know whether it was just a fluke or not, but up until um, up until that point, I think that my biggest flight had been, on the tequila, my biggest XC flight in Scotland had been about 22K or something like that. And um, I'd had the chili about two or three weeks, and I went and met up with Tony Shepherd on the north side of the Monolia. Um, a funny little launch. I can't remember what it was called now, but... Um, he and I walked up it and then I launched it was not there was literally nothing happening and I launched and bombed out and then I walked back up again Tony had taken off on his Xeno and and had, had I scratched about a bit but then found a thumb and got away um and I walked back up and I and I found something and then it was a quite a slow day it was a real day of real patience but I ended up flying I think 45k or something wow. so basically sort of doubled my PB um, within three weeks of having the new glider, and I don't know whether it was that the glider was that much better or what, but um, it certainly felt like that to me. I was like, "Wow, this glider's amazing!" You know, this is going to really open up opportunities for me. And it it um, it was a good. That was a good day. I, um, I remember <laughs> I remember 
getting to base and hearing Tony on the radio um, saying, is there anyone, is anyone out flying today? Is anyone um, on radio? And I, and I answered, yeah, Tony, um, I'm here. Um, I'm at base. And he went, oh, because he'd seen me bomb out. So he said, oh, bloody hell, Warwick, well done. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> so well, I think I'm about 10k behind you. Well, and uh, we ended up landing not that far apart from each other. So it was... Um, that was good. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a good guy, Tony. He's, he's been a good mentor to me as well. He's uh, he's been around the block a few times, eh? and, and he uh, and he's got a good eye for the routes and things. I think some of these old climbers uh, uh, have, got, have got a good eye for things and a good eye for routes for sure. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, Tony's one of a kind of handful of guys who have been fantastic um, to me. Um, you know, I think it's such a special aspect of the Scottish paragliding community that there are these you know and you're you're one of them kind of sky gods who um who are not um above you know just sitting on launch and patiently explaining to a total newbie um you know the ins and outs of paragliding and um I've benefited from you know Matt Church, Jules, yourself, Tony Mark Robson, um, a whole bunch of people, you know, so much. Hey, um, so right, we're on the we're on the Chile Four now, and uh, and you know, there's a link back to India in that you went for a trip in the Alps with Debu and Antoine, and uh, and and a few of the boys boys went with you from Scotland. Eh? That, was that was that 2018 or 2019? I can't remember. So 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so okay, yeah, so... myself, Scott Kidd, Mike, Michael Dearman, and Neil Neil Rollings. Um, who's really my sort of main kind of paragliding yeah. buddy? Um, yeah, we went with with Antoine and uh, Debu, um, and did this kind of Volbiv uh, safari through through the Alps. It was it was really really cool. It was really a great trip. It was one that um, again Mark Robson had done it had done it a few times I think with Tom Straker and a few other guys. Yeah, and um, I remember them talking about it when I was you know total newbie and um i remember i think i remember saying to mark like do you think i'd be able to come on this trip and he was like no worry you're you're really really not ready for it yet um and so yeah for what three four five years later i was uh, i was able to go and do it and and uh he was right i wouldn't have been ready for it <laughs> um but no it was it was really cool so they do um they do a, a route um from Chamonix um, yeah. down towards Nice. Yeah. And um, it's pretty tried and tested. I think it's a sort of fairly well-known kind of, um, you know, XC route. Highway. Yeah, yeah, highway. And they've got a number of potential campsites that they know of along the way. Yeah. And um, they've got a ground support crew, which is a couple of vehicles and... Um, and um, uh, Lynn, who's um, Antoine's wife, Glaswegian, yeah, yeah, the Glaswegian, lovely, most lovely um, Glaswegian lady I've ever met, um, and um, so yeah, they you bomb out, they pick you up. Um, well, ideally you don't bomb out. Ideally you fly to the campsite, but if you do bomb out, um, they pick you up and you arrive and. You know, there's uh, kind of food being cooked over an open fire and there's beers on the go and um, you throw your tent up and sit under an apple tree and chill out. And it's and then the next day you just do the same and it's um, it's a really, okay. really, really cool setup. Yeah, yeah, I fancy um, that. I, I remember watching the the XE find and the track logs, the spots, you know, from, from trips that uh, Mark and, uh, and Tom and things did the year before, I think, and then when you were doing it and... Uh, Quite envious, I have to say, very envious. Uh, yeah, and it was quite. I mean, um, sorry, go on. No, we've got a slight lag on the line, haven't we? It's not ideal, but um, so, so in terms of things you're picking up there on those sorts of trips, you're, uh, how do how do, how do the briefings work in terms of choosing a line and, and, and picking away a, a route, as it were? You're learning from some of the best in the business there. Right? Antoine did the uh, Himalayan Odyssey, uh, you know, a massive old biv in the Himalayas from beer, didn't he, through to Poker and beyond. Yes, um, yeah. So they give you a morning briefing and they give you. Uh, like a go- you know a goal so this is ideally where we're going to try and get to you today and they'll give you a track log to put into your instrument and I think that's a really good thing to have um I'm I, I don't like I, and I've been on you know one trip 
where you you kind of get to base and then your guide goes right now follow me and then you say you all sort of trot off like sheep behind the guide you don't really know where you're going no i like to, to be able to see on the instrument right that's where we are aiming to go and then it gives you i think that then gives you a better understanding of how that's you know your ideal line but the guide's going off in that direction um so why is he going that way when you know in order to achieve that goal how's he going to sort of you know um put all his moves together and um i find that really interesting and a good way of learning and you know then you can sort of talk about it afterwards as well with the kind of knowledge of what you were thinking about in the air if that makes sense yeah 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 um, so yeah that's yeah. how they approach it and it and they um i can't remember how many of us were on the trip but it wasn't many i think it was about eight of us eight um and there was three guides so it's quite a good sort of guide to guest ratio guide to pilot uh, guide to pilot ratio and um a couple of those two or three of those pilots who were who were in the group had done the trip a number of times and they were like really really good pilots and they didn't really need guiding so yeah. um so that meant that um, Antoine and, and um, Debu were able to give their sort of full concentration to um, to anyone who was struggling and um, and help them, and um, it worked really well. I think we we I think us Scots gave a pretty good account of ourselves on the whole, um, and actually we had a, there was a moment of sort of particular pride for me at the end of the trip because um, we had thought to ourselves that we would meet myself mike scott and neil had thought to ourselves that after the the trip had ended we would try and fly back to chamonix ourselves basically vol biv our way back to chamonix and um we did we did sort of attempt that it didn't quite work out the way we'd hoped because the weather wasn't great and also um we ended up staying in airbnbs more than in our tents in fact i'm not sure we ever actually put our tents up at all um but on the very last day um, the weather improved and it looked like it was a sort of decent, exeable day. And so we set ourselves a pretty big task. I can't remember exactly how long it was, but I think it was something like 150k. And um, we flew half of it, um, which, wow. yeah, I, you know, so unguided and in total virgin territory, and having only had a week's experience of flying in the Alps, um, I was quite proud of that. I thought we did quite well. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, it was it was good. Um, it was very interesting to learn about the valley winds as well. I mean, well, th that's such a difference from from, yeah. from Scotland to, to the Alps. It can be quite technical, can it, in the Alps? I remember that. Uh, it can rain a lot, and, and, and the valley winds uh, are, are technical. I remember getting hit by... Uh, Abyssal wind uh, in in Switzerland once, and I, I didn't really understand it or appreciate the dangers, but uh, it just came in right as forecast and, and spanked people, and I was still in the air and got a bit of a spanking. Yeah, uh, that was that was a, a a more peculiar sort of weather frontal associated wind, but just just in terms of the flow of the valley winds, what 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 was uh, what what would you say is the main takeaway in terms of, in terms of the the valley winds from from your experience? Um, I guess just be aware of them, and I mean, Scott, um, we we got a lesson quite early on. Scotty um, found himself landing backwards. I think he was going at about fifteen k an hour backwards when he Whoa. landed. Yeah, um, he he handled it like a total boss um, and was fine. But uh, I got a fright from him telling the story, and um, I mean, I'm I'm very lucky in that I've always been quite fast on my wings because I'm such a such a big guy but um uh it was still a lesson and then i made a mistake a couple of days later um i'd um managed to fly on with one of the guides everyone had, everyone had had decked i think most of them had sort of deliberately given up actually because it was a really really weak day and we'd been scratching on a on a slope for literally hours and every, most of the boys said sod this i'm going to go for a swim but i just stung clung on and eventually towards the end of the day it improved and got to base and ended up crossing the valley and then myself and um one of the guys called paul went on and flew about 30 odd k but um the valley winds were pretty strong and we could see below us that this, they were strong 
Um, uh, but also there was not, we were in a, an area where there wasn't really very good landing options. So I think we just sort of pushed on just almost out of necessity. Um, and eventually uh, there was more open fields below us. And so we, we were dropping down to try and land. And, you know, I started realising that my ground speed had dropped to almost zero. And so I put the bar on. And I was basically sort of dropping vertically on probably three quarters bar and um, took a huge frontal collapse about oh, 15 oh. metres off the ground. Oh, nasty. Uh, 20, no, probably 20 metres off the ground. And um, fortunately, the, the chili looked after me and it just reinflated immediately and, and I landed fine. Um, yeah, yeah. But then I said to Paul like shit I just had a huge collapse and I told him why and he said you must never ever ever apply the bar that close to the ground he was like you know firm with me about it <laughs> so, it sounds like you got away with that one and, and I think I think that sort of uh, underlines the uh, importance of being on a, on, a, on a safe glider until your experience catches up with your ambition I think okay? totally and you know absolutely again it was just one of those things that probably someone had told me somewhere along the line but it just hadn't sunk in and he, you know, yeah. and I think I'll remember it to, you know, the rest of my life now. That he, yeah. him saying to me, it's better to land backwards than to, than to try and apply the bar low, oh, low to the ground uh, in valley yeah. wind, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Just get these little lessons. Yeah. I mean, I've not done I've not done an awful lot flying in in, in the Alps, but I've done a fair bit. And I think with, with those valley winds, I mean, uh, as a general rule, the, the, the wind's going to be sucking up to the big mountains, isn't it? And and if those valley, valleys are sort of steep-sided and narrow then the wind's in the bottom it's going to venturi and be quite strong so whatever the valley uh you, you've got to sort of set up into wind uh, on your approach really because you, you you've got to think well when i drop down i could end up not having any forward speed so if i set up downwind on a normal approach you might not make the land in the field <laughs> quite, you know, that's the general thing and someone said to me once that you know if it is windy land high you know that might be your best option you know you might have to do a uh, land on the valley uh, you know higher on the valley sides and, and a walk down that might be a better bet you know that's it's that completely unknown and there's uh, not really many options land high you know that's, yeah. that's not bad advice i think you're doing for bit anyway but um, yeah, well, jolly good work. That, that, well, that, that again. It's sort of you've you've done a few fantastic trips that sound like you you've got to that stage where you're ragging the arse off your gliders. You're on top of gliders. You've learned a lot. You've had that, had that accelerated learning. So you, you you come back from from the Alps, and again you're looking to, to change your glider. And I know you've changed your glider this year or for this season, and you're on you, you you've gone across to the dark side, as it were. You're no longer on the skywalk, mm. much to my dismay. But I think it's a good move for you. you you've moved to. Uh, is it a maestro? That's right. Yeah, so I got a bit of a, a surprise when I sent my um, chili off for its annual service at the end of the last season. Um, they basically condemned the line set, and I was um, I was really taken aback because the wing was only two years old. It, uh, wow, that's, that is interesting. So what what had caused that? Do you think because well, uh, it, has it been packed down for something? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I I generally really try and look after my wings, but occasionally you know i've my standards have slipped and i probably you know brought my wing home stuffed it in the corner of the sitting room and then and then two days later thought shit you know you know what I probably packed it away slightly damp i should get it out and dry it out properly but i think that um i think i sus- i don't know for sure but i suspect that um there was a day that i went i took it to the beach and uh. it was a really 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 windy day and it was it was just getting thrashed about on sand and stone and then I right. stuffed it into a gorse bush and right. I and I back flew it. I basically it landed upside down in a gorse bush and I sort of back flew it out of the gorse bush and I managed to get it out of the bush and then spin it round and actually launched um, like on a tiny little dune um, from that situation. But I have a feeling that that couple of minutes that it was just, um, you know, the lines were highly under a high Rated. high tension yeah. in this bloody gorse bush and on the beach probably didn't yeah. do it any good anyway so long story short um i decided that i would um get a new glider and uh and i'd read pretty amazing reviews of the maestro and also as you just alluded to i'd been a kind of skywalk man since you know since i got rid of the bolero 
And I just thought I'd try a different manufacturer, you know, just sort of see what else was out there. Yeah. yeah. So kind of on a whim, because I didn't um, have an opportunity to test fly it, um, I rang up a few people. I spoke to Nancy at Fly Bubble and I spoke to Steve at, at Sick and Wrong um, and, sp- you know, spoke to them at length about the, the Maestro. And um, and then I thought, sod it, I'll, I'll go for it. And so I bought it and then I did th- um, three minutes flying on it. Um, me and Neil went and flew off a hill in uh, in Glen Clooney in the winter and, um, and then took it to Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> like you do, like you do. Yeah. <laughs> So it's still a B, I think. Is it still a B, but it's, it's a top, you're at the top of the B category now, I think. With the yeah, so it's a high B. So, I mean, it's probably not, you know, in terms of sort of uh, pilot demand, it's really not that dissimilar from the Chile. Um, yeah. I, I had thought about going up to see, and Neil flies an Alpina, which he occasionally gives me a shot on. And, I, you know, I find the Alpina 3, uh, I've only ever flown it in fairly benign conditions, but I find it pretty easy to fly. And yeah. so I was really sort of, I was really tempted by an Alpina, um, but it was the small kids that made me think, no, come on, be sensible. Yeah. Just, you know, and also I'm a, I am really believe, I really, really believe strongly that um, at the level that we, that we fly at, me and my sort of cadre in the Scottish paragliding community, um, the wing doesn't actually make very much difference. Um, no. To you, to your distance, you're not going to fly an extra thirty k, just because you're on a low C compared to a high B. You know, it's just. And in actual fact, I've seen the opposite. No. So I mean, I've seen um, pilots who will not, uh, you know, go into the back of a corry or whatever because they're frightened of their wing. Yeah. And as a result of that, they've bombed out. And I've yeah. I've you know, got into the back of the quarry and I've climbed out and I've managed to fly 10 or 15k further. So I actually think there's a, in, in some situations, I actually think there's an advantage to having a, a sort of safer wing or a slower wing or whatever you want to call it, a lower wing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, ratio. So, so in terms of aspect ratio, it's probably similar aspect ratio to Chile, I guess. Um, I don't know, maybe, Tim. Maybe. It's not something I pay a great deal of attention to. I'm afraid. No, possibly uh, more cells. Uh, obviously, it's a slightly newer design yeah. or, or a few years new now. I guess the Chile's been out for a few years. But So so in terms of its... Uh, how would you compare it? More agile, more agility? Uh, yeah, so the main... In terms of pilot demand, I would say it's the same. Um, yeah. The huge difference is um, in t- um, turn authority. Um, yeah. I did find uh, the Chile is a huge wing. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of sailcloth above you, and um, I did find occasionally, and I think especially when you're on the edge of a reasonably strong thermal, I would not be able to turn it into the thermal. So you'd be weight shifting like you know all your weight to the left, and you know, and pulling on the late left brake as hard as you could. And um, the and the wing would still fly straight. Well, yeah, it wants to stay flat. It's not not yeah. biting in in the way that the more agile wing Ex- would, would do, I guess. Exactly, and um, I find that the Maestro is much better in that regard. You can turn it on a sixpence, and even when you know you've got a strong thermal ripping up the side of you, you can still turn into it quite quite nicely. Um, nice. I saw a lot of them. A lot of the boys had them in India and. Uh, some of the some of the, some of the guys, I had a couple of conversations where they said, "Yeah, I tried to I tried to rush five and I tried this one and I actually preferred this one." And, and in terms of performance, they seem to go nicely. They've got, I think, is it uh, Papesh? Is it Hans, Hans Papesh, the designer? He used yeah. to do that design for Nova, and Sorry. then they went to Advanced, didn't they? And then yeah, so he, he his company. Up. Yeah, he sort of famously designed the men, uh, one of the mentors, the early mentors that went yeah, to three or mentor four, three, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, well, he's he's always been good at getting sort of uh, next category performance uh, for for lower category handling, you know. So you you're getting C class performance from from B class safety, I would say, with a lot with with with, with that glider for sure. Well, um, so I think it's a good choice. It's, and are you similar similarly weighted? Are you sort of same place in the weight range, or you're heavier on yeah. it? Or? No, I'm probably. I mean, I think um, it's. Uh, fee do a slightly strange thing where they do a sort of weight they do their weight range and then they do their extended weight range and i think the extended weight range the top the top end of the extended weight range is about 130 kilo which is the same as it was on the chili 
Um, and I'm taking off at around about 125, I think. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much right at the top end. Yeah, and good place to be, I think. It is. It's great. I mean, I, so it was interesting in Colombia. We had a couple of really weak days, and I definitely was at a disadvantage then. Um, there was um, days when the boys were able to just... You know, just maintain above launch, and I was and I was bombing out, um, but that's fine. Um, but then, where it really comes into its own is is the speed of it. It's it's incredibly quick, um, and actually, there was a funny, there was a very funny moment. It was um, the the guide was um, Geordie Petz, who's a <clears throat> absolutely fantastic guide um, working for Jockey out there, and he was on a mantra. And um, he'd sort of commented on the on the speed of the maestro um, the day before, and then we had got um, a bunch of us had got to base um, just in the house thermal off launch, and a couple of boys were a bit slow to get away off launch. So Geordie was in that sort of position that I think the guides probably often are in of trying to keep the group together, and there was some people who were sort of wanting to push on, and a couple of guys were still on launch. And so I'd, I'd climbed to, to base and I had set off on glide towards the next climb. And um, it was a very smooth, very smooth air. So I'd um, taken a sandwich out of, uh, and I was, I was hands off and brakes, eating a sandwich. And um, Geordie comes on the radio to me, oh, Warwick, I can't quite believe I'm going I'm to say this to you, but could, could I ask you to come off bar, please, mate? I'm just trying to keep the group together. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Geordie, but I'm not on bar at all. In fact, I'm in the middle of eating a sandwich. Um, so, yeah, it was... He, I mean, I, he, he and I sort of more or less kind of speed tested it. Uh, he speed tested the, the maestro against the mantra, and to be honest, we're basically the same speed at, you know, at uh, no bar, sure. half bar, and pretty yeah. much full bar too. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, well, they are. I think you, uh, as I say, I mean, you, you're getting a performance from a, from a big glider, uh, and, and and that one, that moisture does seem to go very well. So, uh, yeah. you, you know, it's not going to hold you back, and you're going to get that sort of passive safety with it as, as well. So I think that, that, that'll be a good one. It'll be interesting to... So you took it to Columbia, it behaved itself? Yeah, I had a couple of... Um, Small collapses, but um, nothing out of the ordinary, and um, nothing to be concerned about. Um, and again, I started off quite gingerly because I was not familiar with the glider and just wanted to sort of settle into it. But within three days, I was, you know, managing to relax into it totally and, 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 and to feel it a bit more and right? using the bar to its maximum um, between glides and stuff. So yeah, it was cool. Yeah, um, and and so, it was interesting, Columbia, because I I'd, I'd sort of gone out there thinking it was going to be really mellow flying, and a lot of it was, but but some of it was not. I mean, there were some days where it was really strong and really rough, so uh, you had to be super active, and um, that was a again sort of came back from it feeling really confident with the glider, you know. Going on for an hour now, I think we might edit it down a little bit, but. Uh, they are in terms of. Uh, I remember one of the podcasts, one of the cloud based mayhems, and one of the early ones they were talking about, you know, I think Gavin had asked someone, uh, you know, do you think we've reached a limit? And then he sort of said, it was, this guy was a climber, I think he worked for um, Black Diamond or someone, and he, and he sort of said, well, quite philosophically, he says, well, it depends on what the metric is. He says, if your metric is distance, he says, well, well, maybe we, well, maybe there is a limit. But if your metric is the line and the aesthetic of the line, and then it's limitless. <laughs> and then I love that. I actually love that. From yeah. the climbing perspective, it's about the line. And, and, yeah. and I've seen some of your flights, and you, you're obviously not afraid to go into boonies and to go in deep. And there's some interesting lines. And it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, folk like you and Adrian and, 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 and Tony and, and, and the boys, you know, I'm always looking at the aesthetic of the line and thinking, oh, that was brave. <laughs> For sure I would have gone in there. So what, what's your outlook in terms of XC potential and XC... Uh, in Scotland, have you got some sort of interesting lines to? to how do you look at things? Um, yeah, in, in various different ways. Um, I do want to, you know, I am on the XC League, and I do want to continue to sort of compete. And I, I really want to break 100k in, in the uh, in the UK. And um, I've I've been thinking that once this uh, lockdown lifts, I might spend a week or so down in England and see if I can just bosh out 100k somewhere. Um, yeah. 
But give me a shout. I'll come down with you. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, a plan. Let's do that. Um, but I totally agree about the aesthetic. I you know I would absolutely love to launch above my house, walk out of my house, walk up the hill, yeah. launch, fly a triangle and land in the field below my house again. Oh, yeah, you know, that's a dream. That yeah, that's would a be nice a dream. Time. And it wouldn't have to be, you know, if I could do a no. I know, 40k triangle, then that would be yeah. superb. Um, yeah. I, the kids watch you coming into land. Yeah, exactly. And it's just sort yeah. of this idea of, um, like... I don't know, not having to use a car and, you know, just being able to yeah. walk up. Um, I, um, I've never been frightened of walking. I used to be a army, I used to be in the infantry, so, I, you know, the prospect of putting a big pack on my back and walking a long distance doesn't frighten me. Um, and I, so, yeah, I've not, I'm not too fussed about going over the boonies and, you know, and I think that it's very rewarding to do it because you, you get to see... Uh, glens and mountain tops and areas that no one else really goes to or very few people do and I think that's one of the things I absolutely adore about about Scottish paragliding is that you know we are this tiny cadre of people in a country of 55 million you know souls who get out into these extraordinary remote and wild places and just get to see them from angles that no one else gets to see them from. And, you know, when you're cruising past a scree slope 15 feet above it, um, on the back of a mountain, there are no roads below you, you know, you just know that almost no one else ever has seen that scree slope from that exact angle, you know, in that fashion. And that, to me, is a really cool thing um and I, I've always I've always been a mountain guy I love mountains and I love camping and um you know so the prospect of trying to do a bit more volbiv in Scotland really entices me although I'm fully aware of the you know the difficulty of finding two or three flyable days um consecutively um is a problem um but yeah, I just want to explore more of the mountainous terrain around me, and and but also I want to do you know I just want to do more of what we already do, which is that you know, the kind of excitement that builds on Telegram when a big day is looming, and then you know the debate about where to go, and then people converging from every corner of Scotland, and the crack, yeah. you know, all the banter and the crack, and catching it's up, great, catching it? up with friends, and you know yeah. that sort of half hour or so on launch when you or just getting ready and talking about where you might go. I just love almost, I love all that side of things almost as much as the actual flying itself. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I really yeah. miss that. I have to say, I'm, I'm not I'm not so much a lone wolf. There are a few sort of uh, lone wolves in, in the fold, but uh, the, the camaraderie and meeting up on the hill and seeing people that you've not seen all winter for the first time in the spring, there's something about it, isn't there? It's a good crack, I have to say. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other big, the other big goal that I have, and I don't know whether it's still um, a prospect, is that is to go and do a Volbiv trip in India. So um, Neil and Neil Rollings and I have have arranged to to go with Debu on a private Volbiv trip this autumn, um, and we want to you know fly from Beer to Manali and maybe into the Spiti Valley and that sort of area. Um, but you know whether or not that's still a prospect. What with this situation, I don't know. Um, but that's you know no, that's no, probably the ne- uh, that seems to me to be kind of you know like I've talked earlier about these leaps forward, and that seems to me yeah. to be the the next big jump forward is to you know go over the back the in India out- and, the, yeah, and, the, the, and and the high altitude stuff. I yeah. think you picked the right man. Debu's uh, De- Debu's definitely the man. He, he posted up a video from last autumn. Uh, I was actually there, but I, I, I managed to get stuck below an inversion that day. But he was at uh, 5,800 metres, uh, flying to Manali and back again. <laughs> yeah. hypoxic at times, I think he was. Oh, so, there, yes, I spoke to him about that video because he's there's a little bit of him talking at the end of the video and he's just <laughs> talking total <laughs> gibberish. <laughs> and at one stage, his glider seems to have twisted. I don't know if he was on purpose or not, but he seemed to get twisted partway through the video. But, yeah, um, He's a great well, guy. I, I have a lot of time. He's, he's, a good, he's a good lad. He took my sister on a tandem once, and I have to say, uh, he has no one better to, to go flying with than Debbie on, on a tandem. Um, let's, let's sort of draw this to close. We're conscious at time. 
I don't know if you wanted to say anything about your chairmanship of, um, of the federation. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I got bounced into being the chairman of the SHPF. Um, I, uh, the Highland Club had sort of discussed the fact that we didn't have anyone on the um, committee and I said I would look into it and I, so I contacted the committee and said, you know, if there's a place going, I, I, just a sort of quiet, low-key place, I would um, be interested. And I was looking at, they were talking about as the sites officer because obviously the sites officer in Scotland doesn't do very much. Um <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, they had, they said, oh, yeah, we're going to have a phone call, a committee meeting, sort of phone call this this evening, and we'll let you know. And then they rang me back later and said, right, well, yeah, we, we'd love you to join the, the committee as the chairman, please. Fantastic. <laughs> so I was Fantastic. Like, oh, Christ, okay. I'd have to say they, they picked the right man, and I think you're doing a good job. Uh, it's much appreciated by the, the lazier uh, of, of our fraternity, which I count myself amongst. Uh, I have to say uh, you're doing a cracking job, mate. Keep up the good work. Well, thanks, Tim. I mean, that's very kind. I sort of consider it as a bit of payback for all the people who've helped me, and I'll do it for a couple of years, and then I'll, and then I'll you know, sort of let someone else take over the reins. But... No, it's great. I mean, the things that we've really, I'm proud of over the last two years are the club coach courses that we've run and then yeah. the, the repackers course that Sam Smith is on the committee with us set up. And we've now got, you know, a bunch of guys on their way to becoming um, repacking qualified. And that, I think that's going to really benefit the, the, the community. Um, yeah. And um, the Ratha repack, you know, I mean, yeah. um, every year we, we, we find at least one reserve that would not have opened, you know, had it been thrown in anger. Yeah. And, you know, when that sort of thing happens, it gives me a little lump in my throat even talking about it now. You know, I'm like, you know, possibly we've saved someone's life doing that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, for sure. That, that, so that makes it all worthwhile and it's, it's meaningful. And um, I'm very conscious Definitely. of the fact that we take five quid a head off everyone who's in the BHPA in Scotland every year and I sort of feel a, an obligation to try and you know make that money do something meaningful and I think we I think we do do that I hope we do yeah that. yeah I think so keep up the good work mate I have to say yeah. and just remind me I must I must recap my uh, reserve in this fallow period is a good time to do it isn't it absolutely um, yeah, no, it's okay. So just to, just to, to finish off, uh, I thought I'd put in one of these sort of, uh, I didn't know how to finish a, a podcasty type sort of interview. And I thought, like, well, I'm just reading a book on uh, daily rituals and, uh, okay. you know, of the great and the good and those sorts of things. And I, I thought it might be a good idea to finish on whether or not you've got any rituals or routines or mantras that you might want to share with folk, fly in or otherwise related, that you think have been uh, useful to you. Um, one thing that stuck in my mind, um, I think it was from one of the... the Gavin McClurg podcast was the four by four breathing technique. Um, and if, oh yeah, yeah. If you get scared um, to focus on your breathing and four, is it four? Breathe in for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds, and repeat that four times. Um, and I tried it because I, I, it was really weird. I think I had, I think um, I was in a bad frame of mind, but I went up Glencanic one day and just took off on my own and I got into some like, mildly snotty air that really on any normal day would have been nothing to be concerned about. And I got absolutely petrified and um, started doing this four by four breathing technique. Four and, I, four. and I really find it helps. Yeah, um, I, I must give it a go. I'd, I'd heard that, but I've forgotten it. Uh, and uh, yeah, four by four. There's a lot of uh, this... Um, breathing practice and things going on at the moment with the coronavirus as well isn't there so i think breathing is tremendously important to all sorts of aspects in life really um yeah lovely definitely. yeah well that's brilliant warren i think that's i found that tremendously interesting mate and it's been uh, good to watch your progression and uh, it sort of made me realize that my own flying had sort of plateaued and stagnated to a certain extent and that i had to sort of reappraise my own ambitions. I think it's good to see the younger folk like yourself coming through with a bit of drive and determination and, and the ambition that, that maybe some of us have um, left by the wayside. <laughs> well, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think we, um, we are all, it is, it's a, you know, we plateau and then we, and then we, we set a goal and we, you know, we leap forward. But I mean, people like Adrian Howe and and um, Sebastian Ryder have really helped yeah. in that regard as well, because they've just been really imaginative about sort of setting themselves crazy tasks. And I, I mean, I, one of my great memories of Scottish flying was um, pulling up in a lay-by um, at three o'clock in the morning um, at the foot of Ancelloch and having a quick cheeky cigarette with uh, with 
Seb and Roland Ryder and Adrian, and then you know walking up Anchalak in the dark by you know by with with our head torches in the in the middle of winter too. So you know walking up yeah. th- through snow, and and then being on the summit of this you know what is just one of the most phenomenal Monroes in the Highlands um, at dawn and just watching this glorious sunrise and then flying off it. And, you know, I, I, I was on a ozone ultralight, so I just flew back to the car and landed and I had to go home and work that day. But those guys flew off into the um, major boonies and had an absolutely epic kind of saga of a walk and a bit more flying and stuff. And it was really inspiring, really fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Keith, lovely. That's, uh, I think that's, uh, that's probably all about, about all I've got, to be honest, Warwick. I think that, that that's a, probably an opportune place to, to draw it to a close. Thanks ever so much, mate, and uh, stay safe. It's been a pleasure, Tim. Thanks very much. I've enjoyed it. All right, Father, well, we'll stop it there then, shall we? Cheers. <laughs>